Well, please turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be considering the beauties of this chapter this morning. And as you turn there, I want to remind you just that 2 Corinthians is a letter that's very personal. And so, so much of what we will hear from the Apostle Paul's hand under the inspiration of the Spirit is very deep to him. A lot of this is revealing his thoughts and attitudes and convictions and his pains and memories and sorrows and motives for ministry. And as he was attacked and criticized in this context, he continued to look to the Lord. And we will see exactly how he did that and how we might follow him in it. Chapter 4 will be our text for the morning. Before we dive in, let's seek the Lord and ask for his help. Father, we look to you now with your word open before us. I tremble. Lord, you are holy. And those who open your word, who proclaim it, oh Lord, are so weak. So I pray then, Lord, in light of what many brothers and sisters have asked before, I ask the same this morning, that what we have not, you would give us. What we know not, you teach us. What we are not, you'd make us. For the glory of Christ, for the joy of all nations, we pray together. Amen. It is strange to me a little bit, you might find it strange that uh, a classic rock song by Meatloaf is actually helpful to our understanding of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I know, you might help me by finishing this lyric, and I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Who would have thought we'd be talking about meatloaf this morning? And I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Disclaimer at the outset of the service. If you're found humming that song, you will be removed from your chair throughout the service. So if I happen to hum it, excuse me. But it's catchy, isn't it? Because even if you've never heard that song, you probably know that line. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Well, similarly, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 has taken the mindset, the mentality for ministry in a like manner. He said, all the things that God has given me, when I remember and I reflect on the great privilege of getting to serve in the name of Jesus, getting to proclaim the gospel of Christ, when I think about what I have been given, what I have, man, I would do anything for God. But there are some things that I won't do. I won't do that. In fact, the entire chapter flows in that mentality, in that approach. He's saying, I would do anything because of what God has given to me, but I won't do that. Let me give you a little bit of the lay of the land of 2 Corinthians 4 as we begin our time in the Word. The theme of this chapter is found in in verse 1 and verse 16. And it bookends the entire chapter, showing us this is the main point. The word, the phrase is, we do not lose heart. So the banner over 2 Corinthians 4 is about encouraging endurance in service to Christ. Encouraging endurance in ministry. Paul is saying that he and his ministry team, they would never become so discouraged that they would give up or lose heart. And he unfolds that main thought in three sections. They almost follow the paragraph breaks here, but these three sections of six verses each, they all begin with what we have. And then they lead to the things that Paul says, I won't do. For instance, look at verse 1. This is the beginning of the first section. It begins with this line, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. So that's what he has. Verse 7 begins the second section. But we 
have this treasure in jars of clay. Do you see the pattern, what we have? And then you see it again in verse 13, the beginning of the third section. Since we have the same spirit of faith. Now again, these sections in 2 Corinthians 4 function kind of like a shoebox. So think of a shoebox. You know, when I was little, I loved getting the gift of new shoes. I especially loved getting the shoes that my older brother had. So anytime he had those shoes, I would long to have the same ones. And I can remember often, whether a birthday or at Christmas, if I saw a gift that looked like a shoebox, man, my heart was singing. And so what happened is when you get a box of shoes, right, when you get a pair of shoes, you open one gift, one box, but there's really two gifts inside. That is, right, I've never had a gift uh, of one shoe in a shoe box, but what you see is one gift. When you open it, there are two gifts inside. In a similar way, 2 Corinthians 4 flows like that. There are three shoe boxes, verses 1 through 6, verses 7 through 12, verses 13 through 18. And each time as we're going to open that shoe box, we're going to see two commitments that Paul said, I will never do. Does that make sense? So if you're thinking about meatloaf or shoes today, you're at least part uh, along with the sermon, where we're going. But the point is that Paul is saying, I would do anything for the Lord, but there are some things I won't do. We're going to talk about each one of those. He makes these commitments. Let me remind you. These commitments to, to not do this, he makes them in response to the Lord's grace, not as repayment for the Lord's grace. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's not saying, oh, well, Jesus has paid for my sins now. Boy, I just got to do all this service and ministry in order to pay him back. That's oftentimes the mentality that we serve other people in. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying, when I remember what Jesus has done for me, I can hardly help but by responding with a life of service, of knowing him and making him known. I think of this sometimes as like the hospitality guilt have you ever experienced hospitality guilt? That's when somebody invites you over for dinner, and then right when you get in the car, your spouse says, or somebody says to you, man, we really need to have them over to our house right away, right? It's like you're trying to repay the gift that was just given to you. There's no hospitality guilt here in 2 Corinthians 4. It's all reflection upon the gospel of grace and the immense privilege it is to serve Jesus and then responding with a life of commitment and endurance in ministry by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, not white-knuckling it, but for the glory of God. Now, obviously, we are not apostles, as Paul was, nor are all of us in this room pastors. That We realize that, that's clear. But what I want you to see from the text this morning, I want you to be encouraged in your endurance. Because though you might be, not be an apostle, or no, you might not be a pastor, every Christian has been called to a ministry. I'm going to show you that from the text specifically. And in your ministry, though you may be discouraged this morning, however you are serving the Lord, the text, God's word, is going to show us, oh man, the gifts that he's given to us and the commitments that we, by his grace, might make in response to such wondrous love. Does that make sense? So our three points this morning, you might think of them as those three shoe boxes. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 and one shoe box and so forth. Let's dive in then to this first shoe box, this gift that's been given to us, and the two commitments that Paul makes and we likewise can make. So Box number one starts in verses one through six, and if it had a title, this is what it would say. Because we have this privilege, because we have this privilege, I won't quit my ministry, and I won't compromise my integrity. Because we have this privilege, I won't quit my ministry, and I won't compromise my integrity. That's what Paul says. Look at the gift that he speaks of in verse one. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. Now he's continuing a flow of thought back in chapter three, 
in which he was comparing the old covenant under Moses to the new covenant under Jesus. And he's saying that those who serve and minister in the new covenant, those who are Christians, those who are ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have a profound privilege. Because when you compare the old covenant to the new covenant, it's like holding up a match to the blazing sun. There's just no comparison. The new covenant is so beyond unfathomably better. I can't even use enough superlatives to communicate it. In chapter 3, he said that the, the old covenant was a written on tablets of stone, but the new is on tablets of human hearts. The old was a ministry of condemnation, but the new in Christ is a ministry of everlasting righteousness. The old was about a ministry of law and death, but the new is a ministry of the Spirit that brings life and freedom and light. And so he's saying, would you rather serve in a graveyard or in a garden teeming with life? He's saying, the new covenant is full of life, and it's an immense privilege, a staggering honor, because that not only have we been saved by mercy, but we've been, been entrusted with this ministry, this service by mercy. We don't deserve it. We didn't make the team. We got invited to it. <laughs> we didn't earn our spot at the table. God gave it to us, and he's entrusted us with this message of hope and life. And when you think about that gift, what an honor. Is it not? What an honor. Well, that led Paul then to make a commitment. The first commitment we see him make is then, in light of the gift we've been given, because we have this privilege, I won't quit my ministry. I won't quit my ministry. That's how the end of verse 1 closes. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, right, we don't deserve it, we don't, do not lose heart. Now, Paul was saying, look, there are plenty of reasons to be discouraged, in service to the king. But we won't quit. Do you know why? Because if God called us to it, he will see us through it. It is too immense of a privilege to turn my back on. So church, let me remind you that what the New Testament says and what it teaches is that every Christian is a servant of Christ. Every Christian has been given gifts, and every Christian is expected by the Lord to use those gifts in service to him and to others. You might say that every Christian has been given a ministry. You see that word in verse 1? That ministry, it's diakonia. When you hear that, you think of deacons, don't you? You think of servants. It's the same word grouping, diakonia. Ministry, according to Paul and the New Testament, is not for the few, the proud, the pastors. It's for everybody. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5 says, there are a varieties of service, diakonia, but the same Lord. We, we serve, we minister in different ways, but we all minister in the name of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4 says that as each has received a gift, we should use it to serve one another, diakoneo, as good stewards of this various grace. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, we know this, don't we? That shepherds and teachers are to equip the saints for the what? The work of the ministry. Same word, diakonia, in order to build up the body. So church, do you see? Each of you, as a follower of Jesus, has a ministry. I, I don't know where that is happening. It's for sure happening in the church. Maybe it's happening with your neighbor. It's definitely happening within your household. It's happening to the, to the nations, right? Wherever you are serving, God has given you a ministry. And we know that a life of service and ministry is not pleasant. It's not pain-free, is it? Every Christian can and will become discouraged in service to Christ. Anybody ever been tempted to just call it quits? Just throw in the towel? It wouldn't surprise me if some here have even showed up thinking to themselves, giving up sounds like a really good idea today.
Maybe you're discouraged by your own sin, your own failures in service, your own inadequacies. Maybe you feel so unimpressive. You just can't get the job done. You think, I'm useless. What's the point? Maybe the sins and failures, the hurtful actions and decisions of other people, other Christians has caused you to grow discouraged in which you say, no, I'm not going to serve anymore. I've been burned. I gave my trust to them. They broke it. I can't serve these people. I need to step aside. Maybe the pace of life for you has burned you out and you're exhausted. And so you're discouraged. Maybe it's the pains of life that have you discouraged this morning. You feel like a boxer or like a UFC fighter in his corner between rounds. You're beaten and you're bloodied and you're simply begging your trainer. You're begging the Lord to throw the towel in. I can't take any more of this pain. I can't take it anymore. God, just call it quits for me. Take me out. Maybe you've showed up and you're so discouraged that you've actually taken yourself out of service already. Wherever you are, the Lord wants his word to encourage you to endure. He wants to strengthen you to serve. For he's called you. He's given you an immense privilege to know him and serve him. And so as Galatians 6 says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Be encouraged and press on. Well, it makes sense then what Paul talks about next. It's no surprise because when you're discouraged in service to Christ and in discouraged in ministry, the easiest way to get out of pain is compromise. It's compromise. And Paul says, I will have none of it. He says, because we have this privilege, I won't quit my ministry. And also, because we have this privilege, I won't compromise my integrity. For how could the gospel of grace, how could I be a minister of that grace and live so disgracefully? Look at verse 2. It goes all the way through verse 6. He says, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, so even if people aren't coming to faith, they're not seeing this, even if they are, it's veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, Paul said, I won't compromise my integrity, even though I'm discouraged. I won't be a con man. That's what these people were doing here. He said, that word for cunning is a word for deceit or trickery. That word for tamper is, a, is a, a picture that's connected back to men in that day who would dilute wine and then they'd sell it for the same profit. They'd cheat them out. These people were con men. These, these opponents of Paul in, in opposition to his ministry and to the gospel, they were con men, essentially. You know, last week after the sermon, I was actually talking with uh, Paul and Susie Stafford uh, about the princes. You remember we talked in that 146, Psalm 146. And Paul had mentioned that con man, that word comes from the phrase confidence man. Because back in about 1849, there were some guys who were going around and gaining people's confidence and trust and then selling them a lemon or cheating them out of money. And so people who were placed their confidence in them, these confidence men, they became con men. That's the same what's going on here. And Paul says, I won't be like them. I won't be a con man and twist the text to fit my agenda. I won't try to trick you to follow Jesus with all the lights and the smoke. No, I'm unwilling to use the lures. I will cut the word straight. I'll give you the word straight because this ministry 
of the new covenant of grace deserves the highest and utmost integrity. So he says, I won't dilute the message and I won't deceive people. And what helps him guard against those temptations, you see in verses 3 through 6, is this good theology. He says, if people reject the gospel, it's not because of me. I'm just a servant. I'm not a savior. I'm just a messenger. I'm not the message. So God can do his work as we preach Christ. So Christian, by way of application, let me ask you. Let me encourage you. Don't lose heart because you're not seeing the results in, the, in your ministry, in your area of service. Maybe in your kids' lives or as you're serving in children's church or you're ministering to a friend. Or maybe you're a part of something we're doing here at Cornerstone. Don't lose heart because you're not seeing results. And don't compromise your integrity in order to get those results. Rather, stand back in amazement at God's mercy to you. Stand back with gratitude. He'd call you into ministry to serve him and to serve the gospel and press on humbly and honorably. Say with Paul, because I have this privilege, I won't quit my ministry and I won't compromise my integrity. Well, if that's shoebox number one, the second shoebox we see in verses 7 through 12, it says this, because we have this treasure, because we have this treasure, I won't deny my inability and I won't resist adversity. The gift that Paul speaks of in verse 7, he says that, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. What he's saying is that along with this, this ministry that we have, this ministry to tell others of Jesus, we have this treasure within us. He's likely connecting back to what he said in verse 6, where he was talking about the, that, that people are blind to the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, but the same creator who spoke light into darkness at creation has spoken light into the darkness of our lives and our hearts. Death reigned, but because the gospel has come and because we've seen the glory and beauty of Jesus and his worth, his peerless worth, we've now been given life. We've been given this treasure of the gospel message. And we've been entrusted with this treasure. You would think that surely the surpassing treasure like this of the gospel, that God would want the best container possible, right? Like lockdown security. That's not what he chooses. He puts his treasure in clay, in earth, in dirt. He puts it within his people. This phrase, jars of clay, Paul wasn't anticipating, you know, hey, someday there's going to be a cool Christian band that can really use this, so I'm going to write this to the Corinthians. That, that wasn't his mentality. The mentality was this word picture expresses our truest identity. See, vessels in that day, earthenware, these clay pots, they were fragile, they were breakable, they were expendable. They were inexpensive and they were unimpressive. And oftentimes they had many different uses within a household. Sometimes it would be to pour water out or to wash your hands. But probably what Paul has in mind are the, the jars of clay, the, the vessels that were used as trash receptacles, maybe even used for human feces. Do you see the lowliness that a jar of clay has when a jar of clay finally realizes he or she is a jar of clay? Paul never forgot his own insignificance and he never forgot his own inability. And so in light of this gift of treasure that had been given to him, the commitment he made was this, I won't deny my inability. I won't deny that about me because he finishes, this is the reason, because we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul, he's saying, I know I'm unimpressive. I know I'm weak. I know I'm pitiful. I know I'm not good. 
right? His opponents were just hurling these accusations and criticisms against him. He probably just stood there and said, yeah, you're right. That's not even the worst of it. Paul, you're the scum of the earth. You're the you're that residue on the bottom of the trash cans at the landfill. Paul would say, you took the words right out of my mouth. He never forgot his own insignificance, and he never denied his own inability. Do you know what he rather did? He boasted in it. By the time you get to the end of 2 Corinthians, Paul has heard from the Lord who told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And do you know what his response was? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knew his inability and he knew God's ability that promoted in him deep humility. And we ought to think likewise. We ought to think likewise. Inability is the prerequisite for good ministry. And if you've forgotten that, I invite you to come and reconsider that again. But David Pallison, a man who's just a godly man, has gone to be with the Lord. He left weakness as his legacy in ministry. He had spoken on this exact topic at Westminster Theological Seminary's graduation in 2019. So here are guys being sent out into ministry. And do you know what David encourages them to remember? You're weak. He spoke about weakness in, in incredible fashion, but I want to draw your attention to the way he ended his message. I mean, imagine, these are, these are guys who are going to go out and do the work of ministry, right? These are pastors being sent out. This is how David ended. My deepest hope for you is that in both your personal life and your ministry to others, you would be unafraid to be publicly weak as the doorway to the strength of God himself. Who writes things like that? Who says that? Somebody who knows his weakness and who likewise knows God's greatness. Somebody who is lowly and humble and broken and contrite and blessed to be used of the Lord in any way so that his power would be put on display. So might we ask ourselves, why are we working so hard to appear so strong? Why do I struggle so hard to be seen good enough? Good enough for God. Good enough for other people. I, good enough for myself. Friend, embrace your inability. Don't deny it. So that the power of God might be on display. Because when his power is shown, not ours, then his glory is known. And he is the one who's praised, not us. So don't feel your ordinariness or your weakness or your unimpressiveness. That's a word. That's not a liability to you doing good ministry wherever you are. That's your best asset. So let this spark holy fear and reverence and gratitude and humility and joy that the Lord would entrust us with this treasure and in all of our inability, all of our insufficiency he would make and prove himself to be able well Paul then moves from inability then into adversity this is the second commitment he makes in light of the treasure he's been given he says I won't resist adversity look at verse 8 through 12 we are afflicted in every way, he says, but not crushed. In other words, we're squeezed by troubles, but not with a way out, without a way out. He says, we're perplexed, but not driven to despair. I might be bewildered at times, but I'm never hopeless, he says. Verse 9, 
persecuted but not forsaken. People might hunt me down because of my service to Christ, but I will never be abandoned by God. We're, we're struck down but not destroyed. We may get da- knocked down, he says, but we will never get knocked out. Verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be magnified, ma- sorry, manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. These verses stagger me. I I just admit, I, I don't know what to do with them. They do not fit the way I think. Adversity is not, is not something that I tend to have this perspective on. He didn't avoid it. He, he embraced it because he knew that suffering in the service of Christ would magnify God and it would bless others. Primarily because as Paul would learn to die, not to atone for people's sins, but die to himself in service to others, that's how the life of Jesus would be revealed. That's how the beauty and worth and power of Christ would be made known to sinners who needed the gospel. Warren Wearsby, I love what he wrote. He said, sometimes God permits our vessels to be jarred so that some of the treasure will spill out and enrich others. That's just not my perspective. That's not how I think. My instinct in adversity is to think and talk about how much things are affecting me and hurting me instead of how much this might be exalting God or maybe even benefiting, blessing others. Because my focus is so much on myself. Paul says when our focus is on the Lord, we don't have to resist adversity. Because it's in the same way that God revealed himself to the world in Christ Jesus. Not in nobility and, and high dignity, but in lowliness. In a very human way, I might add. God spoke to us in his son, lowly, weak, and unimpressive carpenter from Galilee who lived with his hands in wood and who then died with his hands in wood. And so why would we, as servants of Christ, expect anything different for our life? Christ came to serve, not to be served. He came to die, not to have his best life now. False teachers and con men will tout their ability and they'll resist adversity. But those who are disciples of Christ who've been entrusted with this treasure and this privilege, we will confess our inability with joy. We will gladly spend and be spent for others. And by faith, we'll even, by his grace, be willing to let him stretch our lives out into the cruciform. Service is about dying. Ministry to others is about dying to yourself, to your dreams, to your wants, to your preferences. It may even be about dying physically. But the whole point of it, what is it, church? It's so that in our dying, the living Christ might be made known. And that that would magnify God, show his greatness in our weakness, and it would reveal the living Christ to those who need him. That's what Paul's saying here. He's strengthened by the gift that he's been given. He's committed, saying, I I won't... I won't deny my inability. I won't resist adversity because I know that God has a wonderful plan for my life. A plan that even follows in the steps of Jesus. For God's plan for my life and market Christian for your life is a plan that lovingly exposes every crevice of our weakness so that his power can be put on display. And it's a plan for your life 
that will use every adversity to teach you to lose your life, you might find it in Jesus and you might give it in service to others. And so we approach then our final shoebox, verses 13 through 18. Because we have this faith, because we have this faith, I won't forsake God's glory and I won't forget eternity. I won't forsake God's glory and I won't forget eternity. Paul looks at this gift he's been given in verse 13. He says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what's been written, I believed and so I spoke, so we also believe and we also speak. What he's saying is that I have this faith that's been given to me that's just like the psalmist. That psalmist in 116, he was suffering to the point of death. It was a life of anguish. But he kept trusting God, and he kept telling others about God. And so Paul here in verse 13, he's looking back at Psalm 116 saying, that's the kind of faith that, that God's given to, to me. That's, that's what I have too. I don't care if they kill me. I, I have to keep trusting him. I get to keep trusting him, and I get to keep telling others about him. It won't stop me. This gift has been given to me because the gospel, the new covenant, has given me an unshakable hope. This resurrection hope that even in adversity and affliction and persecution and criticism and complaining and crushing, even in death itself, though they may assault me on every side, I can't and I won't stay silent. Jesus is too good to be quiet. And so he makes these two commitments. The first one he says is, I won't forsake God's glory. He believes and so he speaks. Verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul and his team, they didn't just say that Jesus is better than everything in every way. Their talk wasn't cheap. Their lives backed it up. They had seen the unfathomable worth and peerless beauty of Jesus he was crowned the unconquerable king, the unrivaled king in their hearts. And they said, oh, we're so compelled. If we know this Christ, if we know this king, we know this message of hope that he died for sinners and he rose again on the third day such that everybody who believes in him will be saved. If that's the truth, then instead of just letting thankfulness and praise rise from my heart, we want to go to continents where people have never heard of him. And we want their hearts to rise up in thanksgiving. We want to see guilty people hear the gospel of grace and then have lives lavished with grace so that gratitude rises up and God is glorified. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's amazing. And because of that resurrection hope and with that mission, I will not forsake God being glorified in others' lives. He then says, I won't forget eternity. I will minister on mission. I will serve with an eye to future glory. Verses 16 through 18 say, so we do not lose heart. Though we, our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're, they're fleeting, they're passing, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, Paul is scoping out eternity. He says, as we look, as we fix our eyes beyond this, as we look through the windshield, as we look through the curve, so many things that hurt us and assault us will just pass by. 
because we are so focused on what awaits us. And so, Paul says, perspective is the key to this endurance. I won't forget about eternity as I serve others. Because when I, do, when I don't forget about it, all that affliction that is heartily light and momentary, right? Being stoned nearly to death and being beheaded, and pr- that's hardly light and momentary. Whatever we're going through is hardly light and momentary. But Paul says with that perspective, it will be. We can say with integrity, go then earthly fame and treasure. Come disaster, scorn and pain. For in thy service, pain is pleasure. With thy favor, loss is gain. For I have called thee Abba Father. I've stayed my heart on thee. Storms may howl and clouds may gather. But all must work for good to me. Christian, remember that every moment of your misery is meaningful. There is not one second of it that's failing to prepare for you a spectacular surprise that will magnify the grace of God on that day. So in light of this, what we've been given, may I just ask you two questions. Shall God keep sending people to Montana and to Yellowstone County and to Billings and to Cornerstone only for us to complain about it and to resist it? Or shall we trust his plan and thank him for bringing more guilty sinners to give us more gospel opportunities, to see his grace on display in more lives, to see gratitude rising up from more people's hearts so that God is glorified even more here than he was last year. Shall God keep sending suffering into our lives for us to grow bitter and despise it? Or can we trust him and thank him knowing that all of our pain is not working against us, but for us. And so, church, I encourage you. I invite you. Christ invites you. Do not lose heart. We have this privilege. We have this treasure. We have this hope. So let us, by grace and his strength, say, I won't quit my ministry. I won't compromise my integrity. I won't deny my inability any longer. I won't resist adversity because I won't forsake God's glory and I won't forget about eternity. With that perspective, you can be strengthened to serve and encouraged to endure. Let's pray. Father, we look to you and none other now because the things that we have said, Lord, we long for them to be true in our lives. So please, by your spirit, press them into us. Oh, Lord, if it be by pain, then let it come. Oh, if it be by by pleasure, then let it come. But Lord, teach us of the privilege. Teach us of the treasure. Humble us. Make us lowly dependent servants and put your power on display. Let the living Christ be made known in us and through us as we serve you and serve one another. The glory of your name.